In this video, I want to take a look at work and kinetic energy in two dimensions. So I have this book. It starts at 1.5 meters above the ground, and it slides down on a frictionless ramp set 30 degrees above the horizontal. The book has 2 kilograms. But then it smoothly transitions to the flat ground, and I want to know how far from the base of this ramp it gets before it stops, where it has a coefficient of friction of 0.25. First, I want to know what does it mean to slide smoothly? What I'm going to assume is the particle model. So I have a picture of a book, but it's really represented by a point. And I'm going to say that it's able to make that junction without any extraneous forces. It'll transition from one to the other, keeping the same speed. So how am I going to analyze this? I'm going to look at it in two separate phases. The phase where it goes down the ramp and then where it slows. And I'm going to try to apply work on this, but to be able to calculate work, I need my forces. So I'm going to set up kind of a free body diagram. I may not use Newton's second law on this problem, but I like the way free body diagrams organize my forces and their dimensions. So what are the forces while it's sliding down the incline? Well, there appear to be only two. There's the force due to gravity, which points down, and then there's a normal force, which points perpendicular to the plane. I have been told that it's frictionless. So I want to calculate the work. I need to know the displacement. Since I know the forces are constant, if I find the displacement, then I'll be able to calculate the dot product between the force and the displacement to be able to calculate the work. I've gone ahead and included the displacement on my free body diagram. When you're doing forces, of course, you try to not include anything on your free body diagram. But since I'm dealing with the forces and the displacements calculating work, it's going to help me with my angles. So I see that as it slides down, it's going to go some distance delta r, and it's going to move in a straight line along the incline, which is going to give my delta r displacement vector in that direction. Since I have constant force, I can calculate the dot product for each force in the displacement for the work being done by each force. The normal force is 90 degrees to the displacement, so the dot product is zero and the work done by the normal force is zero. I can calculate the dot product for the force due to gravity is equal to the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them when put tail to tail. Now I have to find what that is. Conveniently, I have them here tail to tail already. And so I'm looking for that angle right there, which is phi. I know that it's 90 minus the original angle I had. So when it comes time, I can tell that it's 60 degrees. But at the moment, I'll just leave it as phi. Delta R, of course, is the displacement down the incline. And I don't know that number. I do know the height that it starts at, which is 1.5 meters. And so if I have the particle model, it's going from this spot, 1.5 meters above the ground, all the way to this junction, which is on the ground. So it's the hypotenuse of this triangle, where this is a right angle. So the displacement times sine theta is equal to 1.5 meters. I've found before that phi is equal to 60. And so the work is just the work due to the gravitational force which is mg 1.5, which I haven't called anything. I'll call that h, so I can just leave it as a symbol, cosine phi divided by sine theta. Now, I could leave it like this, but I might calculate this just to see if the order of magnitude is right. When I put in numbers, I realize something right away. Cosine of 60 degrees is equal to sine 30 degrees. So they, in fact, cancel. And then when I put in numbers, I get a work of 29.4 joules. True story, when I first put this in my calculator, I got something over 3,000, <laughs> which I said, oh, that doesn't sound right. And I put it back in, and I got 29.4, and that seems reasonable. Every time you calculate something, think to yourself, is that sort of a typical number that I would expect? From the work kinetic energy theorem, I know that the total work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, which is the final minus the initial. Now it started from rest, so I know the initial kinetic energy is zero. I also know that the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Should I go ahead and calculate the velocity? I don't think so. 
I still want to do a work analysis of the second stage, and the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, so I don't think I need to calculate it anymore. I know the kinetic energy it has when it gets down to the base of the ramp, and that will be the initial kinetic energy of the next stage. So I think I want to leave it in terms of the kinetic energy itself, which I know is 29.4 joules and also equal to the mass times the acceleration of gravity times the height above the ground that it started at. Now let's look at the situation where it's sliding along the ground. Let's first find the forces. So there's a force due to gravity still, and there's a normal force that's perpendicular to the surface, and now we have a frictional force that is slowing it down. What sort of displacement did it go? Well, the displacement starts at this junction, well, junction, and then it goes to where it comes to rest, and it will be going in a straight line, and I'll call that displacement delta r. So I can go ahead and calculate the work done, since the forces are constant, I just need the dot product between each force and delta r. Note that delta r is horizontal pointing to the right. So the work of the normal force and the force due to gravity is zero because both forces are perpendicular to the displacement vector. That just leaves the force of friction dotted into the displacement vector, which gives me the magnitude of the frictional force, which is the coefficient of friction times the magnitude of the normal force, the magnitude of the displacement times cosine theta, where in this case theta is 180 degrees since they point in opposite directions, and that gives me the minus sign. So the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, and in this case the final kinetic energy is zero because I want to know how far it goes until it comes to rest. It looks like I'm going to have to do some more work though, because I'm trying to find this displacement delta r, how far it goes, but I don't know the magnitude of the normal force. I think I can find that easy enough if I use Newton's second law. I've put a coordinate system here on my free body diagram, and if I look in the y-axis, I know since it's sliding along the ground there's no acceleration, which means the magnitude of the normal force minus the magnitude of the force due to gravity must be equal to zero. And that allows me to solve the magnitude of the normal force is equal to the mass times the acceleration of gravity. So therefore, the work done by the system along the horizontal part of the ground is equal to negative of the kinetic energy it had when it started, which was equal to the kinetic energy that it ended with from the first stage. And I know that that is equal to this work that I calculated, negative, the coefficient of friction, times the mass, times the acceleration due to gravity, that's substituting the normal force into here, times the displacement. And you'll notice right away I get some neat simplification. The mass and the acceleration due to gravity divides out from both sides, plus the minus sign divides out. And then if I solve for r div by dividing both sides by mu, I get that the displacement is equal to the height divided by mu. Now the units check out because height is a length and the coefficient of friction is dimensionless. I can go ahead and plug in those numbers. h is 3 halves, 1.5 meters. The coefficient of friction is 0.25, which is 1 quarter. And so I just get easy integer arithmetic, 3 halves times 4 over 1, the 4 and 2 cancel, 3 times 2, and the result is 6 meters. Notice that saving to put numbers in until the very end saved us a huge amount of effort and a lot of calculation error. And in fact, converting our fractions, 1.5 and 0.25, into integers meant we didn't have to touch our calculators at all. The more simplification we can do without the risk of calculator error, the better off we are. And this is a reasonable number. The units already check out. It's not too large or too small, so we have confidence we got the right answer.